okay um, i think almost all are here so uh, i think let me start the introduction good evening to one and all the society of naval architecture students snas is by the students of department of ship technology we have gathered here to witness the fifth episode of the series of webinar in association with mast and dostas related to naval architecture and ship building for the fifth episode we have dr we have mr devi prasad velapilli a director green farm group dubai he is alumnus of department of ship technology 13th batch he served as a marine and structural consultant at schumberger and he also served as a field engineer in sr offshores and magdamot now it's my honor to invite mr devi prasad sir to lead us to the webinar on the topic oil and gas upstream operations and where naval architects can fit over to you sir thank you so i think i'll start quite fast because uh, we don't have much time and i have quite a number of slides and videos uh, can everybody hear me very well yes sir okay so the basic idea is to give an offshore oil and gas upstream sector and uh, how you guys can get into the same is the main agenda for today's topic uh, i will go through the slides and then in between i'll play some videos and then we will go into a question and answer at the the last uh, part so that's how we will make this uh, presentation shall i start yes sir so the the agenda as i mentioned is uh, will give an objective uh, an introduction to oil and gas uh, what is upstream business uh, some of the videos uh, which you guys can see real videos uh, which are the countries which are into oil and gas where you guys can get an opportunity companies of interest uh, how the learning can be done because right now you are studying in universities where you may not see a lot of these things uh, although you may have a knowledge uh, there is a gap so how to fill that gap is very important for students to understand and uh, how to get there software skills and finally we will have a question and answer session so the objective of this presentation I'm trying to get you guys into the sectors which i'm shown in the screen so the drilling sector floating business in oil and gas fixed platform structures again fixed structures and deep water subsea which is really tough to get in but i'll cover that also as a part of this uh, presentation so what is oil and gas industry i think uh, it's important to know what is the the main segment so i'm going to talk about upstream oil and gas today i will not cover stream and i will not cover downstream which is midstream is a certain interest for us but uh, downstream is really a refinery and processing and everything so upstream basically it includes exploration to find the oil and gas then basically do the field development part of it drilling production operations and there are a lot of services also which come with that actually the midstream is basically how to transport it uh, either through a pipeline or through a tanker system or through any any methodology of transporting this uh, to the refineries or wherever the world requires final oil and gas and the downstream is basically then you are going to distill all the crude into products diesel petrol jet fuel even plastics whatever you use everything comes out of the downstream which is basically a refining process uh, manufacturing refining and wholesale and marketing and that's what basically you use it so you are part of downstream already uh, today and uh, but we are going to cover the upstream oil and gas so first thing what happens is a licensing round how the fields are given actually so as you know the field belongs to the government any government in any country even india is privatizing oil and gas today Uh, they own the field so they own basically whatever oil is inside the, the 
C or the seabed. Uh, they basically doesn't have the expertise to take it out. So they go with a licensing route. So basically they offer a lot of data from the seismic activity. And then basically companies go and bid it and take long-term contracts, short-term contracts, whatever it is, there are a lot of contracting type where oil companies, uh, which I will again cover, which are the type of oil companies, they take this field and then they basically do exploration, production, and take all the services basically to sell those oil and gas to whoever is the end user. So I'll just cover a small uh, uh, slide on who are the players. Of course, there are a lot of players today. Yeah, so initially it was all big players like Exxon, Shell, Chevron, Total, BP, which is international oil companies. There are a lot of national oil companies, which is country-wise. So if you take India, it's ONGC and Oil India. I didn't write it, but you guys should know. Uh, basically, Adnoc, Aramco, QP, uh, Iranian oil companies. So these are national oil companies where government is a stakeholder. And what has happened in the recently because of uh, the crude oil going down, the fields are coming less sizes, a lot of private companies who are investors, and we call them small players for marginal fields. So when I mean marginal fields, it's around 10,000 to 20,000 barrels per day of production, whereas the IOCs and NOC normally pump 100,000, 200,000, and even up to 1 million barrels per day. So what I'm going to cover two topics, shallow water as well as deep water. Most of the Middle East, India, uh, Southeast Asia, these are the markets were uh, morally shallow water. And you go to Gulf of Mexico and North Sea, it's deep water. Uh, uh, it's basically the same principle. The only difference is the facilities are different. So we'll cover up both shallow water and deep water. And exploration production basically covers up C-Speak and other surveys, uh, field development planning, approvals, and investment decisions, drilling, construction of offshore facilities, and production, processing of crude coming from the wells, and finally export or transport this oil and gas. That is mainly midstream, but we will cover it up basically. So how, what is the sequence of activities in a field development planning and execution? So as I mentioned, licensing is done by the governmental organization. Uh, whoever is going to do uh, exploration, normally government do that to get the data. And also after the licensing is award, the oil companies go and do again exploration. They do an appraisal, then they do a field development planning and then basically get an investment decision to move forward. Then they go into production and finally, we have to do a decommissioning and amendment also a uh, normal case because of the environmental requirements. So this is the total cycle, which basically can take closely 50 to 100 years. And sometimes it can even stop in 10 to 20 years, depending on the field size. So again, same exploration and appraisal is two important activities, which happens in the initial stage to ensure we have enough resource and the resource can be commercially viable to take it out and sell and make money, basically. So this is two activities. One is exploration, and one from that exploration results, we do a complete appraisal of the field. So what happens is the first step is a seismic survey, which basically does the exploration and finding out how much oil, how much gas, how much water in the field. And that data is basically converted into uh, how to basically make an appraisal or a field development planning to see the commercialization of the field. And then we basically go into the drilling activity, which is can be from a land, it can be a little more uh, deeper using a barge, jackups, semi-sub and drill ship, which are mainly uh, deep water uh, drilling. So what I'm going to do is I'll switch over to a video to show this the whole sequence to understand a little more than the presentation. Uh, so I'll try to share the video. Just let me know if the video is playing well.
can everybody see the video yes sir yes sir and uh, is the sound is coming also on the video right no sir, no, sir it's not audible okay let me stream downstream so okay okay upstream is actually getting crude So most people think of companies like Exxon Mobil and just assume they get a lot of the ground somewhere in the world, ship that crude and Exxon Mobil pipelines to an Exxon Mobil refinery, sell it in an Exxon Mobil gas station. But guess what? That is absolutely wrong. That is not how this industry works. This is how it works. The industry is composed of four main segments, upstream, midstream, downstream, and service. Upstream is actually getting the crude out of the ground. You also, also been here called EMP or exploration and production. Um, this is upstream. This is upstream. This is upstream. This is actually an FPSO. The next segment is midstream. Midstream is basically moving that crude oil and natural gas. So midstream stuff such as pipelines, super tankers, uh, uh, rail cars. Then we move to downstream. Downstream is actually the refinery. They're hiding, manufacturing, and selling of the products from crude oil and natural gas. So downstream things such as refineries, uh, retail loop stations, a fertilizer, which is a big product of petrochemical refining, um, uh, lubricants, motor oils, uh, retail gas stations, and plastic, which is another large product of crude oil. Then we move to the service companies. Service are companies that actually provide manpower and help and services to oil and gas industry, but they don't produce any petroleum or petroleum products themselves. So you have everything from the guys that are out there designing the rigs to the crew boats that move men and equipment back and forth to the actual roughnecks that do the drilling to the manufacturing of drill stem and things like subsea um, installations. Every bit of this is service. So what does that mean? We're going to talk you through literally from cradle to grave, a drop of crude oil to the plot point where it gets into the gas tank of your car. So the U.S. government auctions off a block of land to the highest bidder. After checking my last uh, auction facts in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, $2 billion um, somebody paid for rights to drill on a piece of land for 10 years. That's it. Think about that for a second. You write a check for $2 billion to have 10 years to make that money back and hopefully some profit, but there's no guarantees. So in this case, it was BP who spent that $2 million for a deep Gulf of Mexico lease. BP then needs to drill, right? BP does not have its own drill rigs. BP contracts a drill rig, basically rents it from companies such as Transocean. Now that drill rig needs to be staffed by people. So you have companies such as Halliburton and Baker Hughes that actually come out and help them operate that drill rig. That crew that gets um, um, produced on that drill rig needs to be transported. Guess what? BP puts out to open bid to all the different industries and all the different midstream companies in the world, who will move this crude oil at the best price? In this case, it was a super tanker and the bid was won by Chevron. So Chevron has that crude oil in super tanker and it's in transport to refinery, but halfway there, ConocoPhillips on their trading floor buys that crude and then turns around and sells it for a few cents profit uh, per barrel. And it was sold to a Shell refinery who then refines that fuel at a profit, ships it in a Kinder Morgan pipeline to a 76 gas station that's owned by who? No, not 76. It's owned by one of your neighbors, which is called a jobber. So there you go. There it is from literally getting out of the ground into being um, burning your gas tank as a fuel. And you look at how many different people are involved and how many different layers of profit are involved. And this is a very complex industry. So hopefully this helps you understand, um, at least at a high level, what goes on in the oil and gas industry. Oil and gas are generated from a source rock. Organic matter buried in the depths of the earth. Once formed, they climb back towards the surface. On their way, cat rocks can impede their progress and they accumulate in reservoir rocks. Here, they constitute hydrocarbon fields, which can be identified by interpreting seismic data, a sort of echography. The data is obtained with the help of a seismic ship. To confirm the interpretations of seismic data, two types of drilling gear exist. Each is adapted to a range of depth of water down to more than 2,500 meters. The platform seen here is a semi-submersible which floats and retains its stabilized position by means of anchors fixed on the seabed. 
platforms at sea are used not only for drilling, but also for the production of hydrocarbons. This production consists of the separation of oil, gas, and water before the oil and gas is taken by pipeline towards a mainland terminal. Where it's impossible or too expensive to link the field to the coast by a pipeline, an FPSO ship is used, floating production storage and offloading barge. On board, the hydrocarbons and the water are separated. The oil is stored prior to being loaded on tankers and the gas is re-injected into the reservoir rocks. Gas from a field is taken to land through an underground gas duct to a processing plant. There, if the gas is to be transported by sea, it's converted into liquid, obtained by cooling it down to minus 163 degrees Celsius. When it arrives at the plant terminal, the liquid natural gas, LNG, is returned to its gaseous state in a regasification plant before being introduced into the local gas duct network. The LNG is stored in tanks before regasification. The crude oil is transported in a petroleum tanker, the capacity of which can attain 200,000 tons. It's commonly called a super tanker. The terminals capable of receiving such giants are few and far between. The ships used to transport the crude oil produced on an FPSO ship are of a much smaller capacity. The crude oil, before being refined, is stored in the port in large capacity tanks. The natural gas is preserved in reservoirs, artificial or natural. It's ready to be injected by pumping into the gas duct network for industrial and domestic use, or as fuel in power generating stations. As far as the crude oil goes, it's transported by oleoduct to the refinery. There it undergoes a number of transformations and blending. A variety of finished products are obtained, LPG, petrol, kerosene, diesel, or naphtha, which will be used as the basis for the composition of plastic product. Our job starts upstream, where we find and produce oil and gas, and continues downstream, where we convert it into fuels, lubricants, and petrochemicals. Exploration is one of BP's distinctive strengths. After negotiating and acquiring the rights to explore, we deploy our specialist skills and advanced technologies. BP specializes in seismic imaging to locate oil and gas fields, which can be miles beneath the Earth's surface or miles beneath the seabed. We specialize in deep water operations and giant fields, from Prudhoe Bay in Alaska to Ramela in Iraq to PSVM in Angola. When it makes business sense for BP, we bring the oil and gas to the surface and either sell it to the market or supply it to our downstream operations. BP's upstream segment produces around 2.3 million barrels of oil and gas per day and has proved reserves equivalent to over 11 billion barrels in key locations around the world, including Angola, Azerbaijan, the UK North Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico in the United States. We manage several complex gas value chains, bringing gas to Asia, Europe, and other markets. Our extensive transport network includes ships, trains, trucks, and thousands of miles of pipelines. We use our supply skills and the skills and knowledge of our expert traders based in key markets around the world to buy and sell to regional and international markets. Supply and trading is closely linked with our portfolio of high quality downstream activities that add value by turning oil and gas safely and efficiently into premium products. Our refineries apply the latest technology and understanding to refine, process and blend hydrocarbons to make fuels, lubricants and petrochemicals. We then supply consumers and other end users with energy for heat and light, advanced lubricants to keep engines moving, and premium fuels for transportation. Our world-leading processes produce petrochemicals such as acetic acid, from which a wide variety of everyday items are made. BP's 
to lower carbon businesses are managed through our alternative energy team, where we develop and invest in biofuels with a focus on integrating them into the hydrocarbon value chain and operate a wind business in the United States. Okay, thank you. I think uh, that basically covers the initial introduction to the oil and gas. So we go to the next topic. Uh, can you see, uh, see my uh, screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. We go into now the second topic, which is uh, the drilling. Uh, so basically, the, the main objective is to, again, to prove the seismic data, uh, the, to find uh, the crude oil and gas uh, in different water depths. So as you can see, there's land tricks. Uh, shallow water barges, jackups, semi sub, and drill ships we use to find uh, drilling uh, as the main uh, structures. So, a typical uh, jackup rig, it's a, a very important um, a shallow water uh, uh, structure for um, uh, mainly for all, all type of uh, drilling activities. Uh, it's constructed in uh, different parts of the world, mainly in the Middle East and Singapore. And uh, there are different phases uh, which are critical as far as the engineering is concerned, uh, floating, jacking, preloading, operations, and storms. And of course, the design itself is a, it's a complex uh, uh, structure uh, where a lot of uh, different disciplines are joined together to design this uh, jackup rig. So drilling as a part of that is also well completion. So once the, the well is uh, created, basically then they will complete the well, like people like Baker, Slumberger, Halliburton, uh, to ensure uh, we can get successful flow of crude uh, into the into the back into the platform. So we go to the next topic is offshore platforms. Uh, so offshore platform is basically segregated into three types: shallow water, deep water, and ultra deep water. As you can see, uh, uh, the fixed uh, platforms, compliant towers, tension leg mini tension leg spar fpsos are the structures which basically called as offshore platform again you can see a different types uh, here uh, tlp tension legs semi sub spar fpso flng and recently the winds are coming as the renewable sector so normally it's on a monopile shallow water uh, structure with the wind turbine you can see the water depth varies from this uh, slide. So from jackets to the, the spar is basically the difference in water depth. Uh, currently, mainly shallow water is going happening because of the crude prices. The deep water has gone less, uh, but uh, you don't know when the crude prices again goes to 100. There is a lot of deep water developments will start. So a jacket is basically a steel structure and it's made of tubular members and piling to the seabed. Uh, the jacker bricks already I covered. Uh, TLP is a, a floating structure with uh, tendons, which is basically moved to the seabed. Uh, drill ship is again, it's a dynamic position or a moved ship basically, which has got a complete drilling facility. So typically this is how a field will look like, uh, especially in a shallow water. So there are different uh, types of jackets, wellheads, accommodation, riser, power generation, processing, and we interconnect all this uh, using uh, bridges uh, so that uh, basically we can work from a central control room and accommodation, and then we just move to other platforms as required. So this is a typically a, a permanent type of offshore field, what you can see from this slide. So there's a deep water and there is also marginal field. So the difference is again, 
how much production period we have 10 years about 10 years again it's it's only the commercialization of crew basically matters finally so on the left side you can see a deep water development and on the right side it's a shallow water where we are basically connecting the 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 two uh, platforms to an fpso and then from there we just take an export uh, stuff to the to sell the crude and the bottom picture is basically a platform with a more pure structure so where we can process again in offshore and sell it at offshore instead of putting pipelines to the onshore same so deep was basically one is a surface field on the left side uh, so basically you can see all the all the structures are above the sea uh, where a lot of people can control it from the control room and on deep water we are mainly using subsea uh, because of the the water depth so it's all subsea development connected by again rise umbilicals manifolds flow lines and then normally it goes to an fpso where the main processing will happen and from there it goes to an export uh, tanker uh, so that's a major difference between a shallow water development and a, a deep water development uh, and the costs are significantly different also for both so typically we are looking at also now marginal fields where you know this one doesn't work so on the left side it's an expensive thing again even it is surface so we are looking at uh, putting a small jacket which is that yellow color structure and then on the side we may put a small more pure converted rig and then you put a basically a, a flow line or a riser or pipeline either to an onshore plant or to an FSO. So you can do both depending on how distance is the onshore from the offshore. Uh, so this is typically what is being developed nowadays for marginal fields where you don't see a big complex. It will be all mobile. So after 10 years, you can really take it out and put it in another field. Basically, that's, that's the advantage of uh, the such developments. So jacket, again, it's a typically, a sub, it's called also a substructure. So you basically have a steel structure and then we are piling. And then on the top, we call top sides or deck. The deck can be a wellhead, it can be accommodation, it can be production, it can be flare. So depending on what is that platform requirement, it's all same, made of steel and installed in the same manner. Again, same, shallow water fixed platform. So you can see how we are doing basically the, the field development for shallow waters using a jacket type of structure. Constructed in different parts of the world, people like McDermott, LNT, NPCC, Sapura, a lot of companies are doing this. They basically fabricate land in onshore, transport on a barge, and then basically installed at sea in offshore. So you can see the slides, everything is there. So on the left, top is uh, fabrication then it's on loaded out and then transported to offshore so these are some of the simulations which we do and it's very uh, interesting for naval architects to get into this kind of stuff where basically you can do a lot of simulations before actual operation takes place so launches appending lifting float over float off piling so all this requires a lot of engineering works uh, to be done and that's where uh, basically you guys can get involved uh, with the softwares most of the softwares are uh, commercial softwares which we are using uh, moses sax orca flex of pipe so these are the softwares which we use to basically do the engineering and this is done uh, very accurately to very important because it's expensive we make a mistake So logistics and heavy lift vessels play a big role. Uh, the cost is quite high uh, because we have to transport all this offshore. So we use uh, heavy lift vessels or barges and tugs, heavy lift carriers, dry tow vessels, depending on today, you know, you make a lot of things in China, Korea, and then you install in Europe and US. So this is a big cost and engineering, this is a, a, an important task. Uh, how to make it uh, cost effective way of transporting to different parts of the world is a key part of uh, offshore construction. So that is why I put this slide logistics and heavy lift vessels. The next part is uh, I, before I go, I think I will play another video to just show this uh, the whole sequence of jacket construction. Uh, I'll
Offshore platforms are offshore real estate, providing a service for EMP companies to carry out the same operations as those undertaken onshore, drilling wells and producing from them, and processing, storing, and exporting oil and gas. Using similar equipment, processes, and techniques to those deployed onshore. So, is that a video? Videos you can see? No, sir. No, sir. No? So, we are still in the slideshow area. The choice depends on the functions the unit will perform now? and on the conditions it will experience. Yes. Can you see now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can see now? Yes. Okay. Offshore platforms are offshore real estate, providing a service for EMP companies to carry out the same operations as those undertaken onshore, drilling wells and producing from them, and processing, storing, and exporting oil and gas. And using similar equipment, processes, and techniques to those deployed onshore. Designs exist for the substructure of onshore platforms. The choice depends on the functions the unit will perform and on the conditions it will experience. Exploration wells are often drilled by mobile offshore drilling units, or MODUs, a generic term for various types of floating or floatable drilling machines. In very shallow waters or in lakes and rivers, drilling can be performed from a flat bottom barge, or from a submersible. Buoyancy tanks are flooded with water until the unit rests on the sea floor. After drilling, the water is pumped out and the vessel can be refloated and towed to a new location. Jack up rigs used in shallow waters of up to around 120 meters have three or four large latticed legs. The rig is towed to the site with its legs up. The legs are then lowered to the seafloor and the top sides are jacked up so that they rest above the water. When drilling is finished, the legs are raised and the platform can be towed to the next site. Semi-submersible platforms are suitable for drilling in a wide range of depths, from shallow to deep. Ballast tanks in the hull are filled with water until the unit is partially submerged, which reduces loading from wind and waves. The platform is then anchored to the seabed. Drill ships, mobile, ship-shaped drilling units, can drill in ultra-deep waters of up to and even beyond 3,000 meters. Dynamic positioning systems adjust their position continually, keeping them above the drill site. Like an onshore rig, motors have a drilling package, a derrick for supporting the drill string, and machinery to turn the drill bit. If they find oil, the well is usually sealed with plugs until a more permanent structure can be moved to site for the production phase and for further drilling. These include fixed platforms, tension leg platforms, semi-submersible production units, spars, and floating production storage and offloading vessels, or FPSOs. Yes, I'm going to one more video, uh, then we'll just...
can you see the screen uh, the video yes sir. yes so okay Drilling a safe, deep water well can take years of planning and preparation. After identifying potential oil and natural gas reservoirs beneath the seafloor using seismic technology, a drill site is selected. Shell geoscientists choose the drill site location on the seafloor based upon the safest well path that will encounter the targeted oil and natural gas. For an exploratory well, in water depths up to 9,000 feet deep, this seafloor location is generally directly above the reservoir. A drilling rig is required to drill a well. In deep water, the rig may be on one of three vessels, a drill ship, a semi-submersible vessel, or it may be part of a floating production platform. All rigs have a hoisting system to raise and lower the drill pipe and tools needed to drill the well a blowout preventer or BOP stack, and a pumping system to circulate fluids in and out of the well while drilling. It's time to drill the hole or well bore using a drill bit. This initial step is called spudding in the well. The shallow sediments just below the seafloor are often very soft and loose. To keep the well from caving in and carry the weight of the wellhead, a large diameter base pipe or casing is drilled or jetted into place. The base pipe is assembled at the rig floor and a drill bit connected to a drill pipe is run through the inside to the bottom of the casing. The entire assembly is lowered to the sea floor by the rig hoist. At the sea floor, the driller spuds the assembly into the sea floor sediments, then turns on the pump. Water or a drill fluid is used to jet the pipe into place until the wellhead is just above the sea floor. With the base pipe and wellhead at the right depth, the driller will release the bit and drill string from the jet pipe and drill ahead. While the well bore is being drilled, mud is pumped from the surface down through the inside of the drill pipe. The mud passes through the jets in the drill bit and travels back to the sea floor through the space between the drill bit and the walls of the hole. Drilling mud is used to, one, lift rock cuttings from the hole, two, keep the drill bit cool and lubricated, and three, fill the well bore with fluid to equalize pressure and prevent water or other fluids in underground formations from flowing into the well bore during drilling. The mud is an environmentally friendly water-based mixture of clay for thickness and fine ground rock or barite for weight. At the planned depth, the driller will stop drilling and pull the bit out of the hole. A smaller pipe or casing string is then screwed together, connected to the drill pipe and run down to the sea floor and into the well. To permanently secure the casing in place, cement followed by mud is then pumped down the inside of the drill pipe. To separate the cement from the mud, a cementing plug is used. The plug is pushed by the mud to ensure the cement is placed outside of the casing, filling the annular space between the casing and the open hole wall. 
On some locations, a second surface casing is needed, thus the well is drilled even deeper. In the second surface casing interval, the well is cemented using a second smaller casing string, repeating the same process used in the last hole section. At this point in the well, the pressure in the deeper rock may be too high to continue with the simple water-based clay mud, or there may be the potential to encounter oil or gas. Before drilling below this point, a blowout preventer with a riser will be installed at the sea floor. The BOP stack is a massive system of valves and rams that protect the rig and environment from oil and gas flows should the weight of the drilling mud be too low. The BOP stack is connected to a pipe called a riser. The riser connects the rig to the well and allows us to circulate the drilling fluid and rock cuttings all the way back to the rig on the surface. The BOP stack is fully tested before we drill further. Drilling now resumes with the drill bit and drill pipe always operating through the BOP stack. Just as we did further up the hole, casing strings are run and cemented in place when needed to cover up the open hole sections. When the oil and gas zones targeted by the geologists are reached and the presence of an oil or gas zone is proven, a final casing string may be installed if the seafloor location is favorable for future development. This final casing string allows for the future safe production of the oil and natural gas. So that's basically on the, the drilling side. Uh, we go to a platform construction uh, video. Rest of the launch cradle, the timber chair, begins with the removal of a layer of earth, precasted concrete slippers with steel plates. The video is not added. Yeah, yeah, yeah. are laid in the slot. Can you see now? The fabricated skid beam is yes, then sir. placed. Yes, sir. Okay. The fabrication of the gigantic MNP jacket structure begins with the removal of a layer of earth, precasted concrete slippers with steel plates embedded on the surface are laid in the slot. Prefabricated skid beam is then placed over these slippers. They are first aligned and then welded with the steel plates of slippers, the guided slot of the skid beam is filled with layers of wax and slip coat. Over this layer sits the timber runners in parts fitting into each other. Separately, fabricated launch cradle is placed on both the sets of timber. They are then bolted and locked with the timber runners. Five leg pots are placed on both the sets of cradle. Leg tubulars are strengthened by welding internal ring stiffeners. Four such tubulars are then joined to form a leg. Legs 2A and 3A thus fabricated are placed over leg pots. With the help of crawler cranes, leg 2B and 3B are fabricated on the sides respectively and are positioned with the required batter. Horizontal and vertical braces are fabricated similar to legs. The X braces are positioned between the legs and welded to complete leg two and three. Crawler cranes are then used to roll up the panels. Vertical braces are positioned and then welded to box up row two and three. After the boxing up of panel two and three, the set is jacked down and the legs 2A and 3A rest on the launch cradle and the leg pots are removed. 
row one and four are fabricated in a similar manner and carried to the respective positions and placed over temporary leg pots. They are then rolled up and boxed up with row two and three respectively. 23 riser pipes are then placed and fixed in the clamps, five each at the bottom between row 1A, 2A, and 3A, 4A, six and seven each between 1B, 2B, and 3B, 4B, respectively. The sum casein, fire water casein, and utility water caseins are placed similarly at their respective positions. Crowd lines are installed to the skirt legs. Yoke plates are fabricated. Then the mud mat is erected. Prefabricated buoyancy tanks are placed on the temporary leg pots on the sides of leg set one and four. They are rolled up and fixed with the jacket structure. Flooding lines are connected to the buoyancy tanks and jacket from the flooding manifold. The upending slings and shackles are then placed in the upending bad eyes. All the final paintings are then completed. The gigantic jacket is now ready for loadout. The loadout process begins with extending the grillage and the skid beam to the quay wall. The 180 meters long S45 barge approaches from stern towards the quay wall. Fixed by the anchors and mooring lines, the rocker arms are brought in line with the skid beam by ballasting and deballasting of water. Four strand jack piston assemblies are fixed near the mud mat on the jacket. The strand wires coming from the piston assembly are fixed on dead man anchor frames on the barge. Two push jacks, one for each launch cradle, provides the initial breakup push. The piston moves ahead and holds the strand. The jack moves towards the piston, carrying the jacket. The ballasting and deballasting of water from the barge maintain the 25 millimeter tolerance. The high precision synchronized movements make the jacket crawl into the barge in tiny steps. Welding plates are fixed to weld the launch cradle with the skid beam of the barge. 28 C fasteners, seven on each side of leg 2A and 3A, are welded to fasten the jacket on the barge. The barge is towed away by a tugboat. Four smaller tugboats move along with the barge to assist it during maneuvering. On reaching the destination, first the sea fasteners are removed and welded on the barge deck. Four ropes connect the four corners of the jacket with four tuck boats. The S45 barge is ballasted and deballasted to create a tilt of around three degrees. This tilt initiates the skidding of the jacket into the water. The gigantic structure smoothly leaves the barge and falls into the sea. The primary and the secondary rocker arm show the steady slip without toppling the barge. After stabilizing, the four tugboats pull the floating jacket to the exact site of erection. The erection is facilitated by a heavy lift vessel LTS 3000 by a JV between L and T and Sapura. The jacket approaches the ship from stern. The upending slings are held by the main block of the crane. The GPS gyro box and the four LBL are placed in their respective positions, which will now help in final positioning of the jacket.
The flooding lines are connected to the flooding manifold through the pumps installed on main deck of the ship, and water starts pouring into the legs and the buoyancy tanks. The jacket starts upending. The final position of the jacket is set by maneuvering the ship with the help of anchor wires. Once positioned, the rest of the legs and buoyancy tanks are filled with water, making the jacket set on the seabed. A cargo barge carrying the piles is brought. The internal lifting tool lifts the pile from the top end and inserts into the corner pile guide. The pile slowly inserts into the pile guides. The underwater ROV monitors the movement of the pile under the water. The first set of piles, known as Z piles, are inserted into the corner legs. The second section of Z piles is first welded with the first section and then inserted. The pile section 1 and 2 puncture the rubber diaphragm of skirt leg and inserts into the seabed by its own weight. The buoyancy tanks are then lifted, water is ejected, and they are removed from the jacket, put into a barge, and taken away. The rest of the insertion is done through hammering, as per the sequence decided by the installation contractor. Finally, the fourth section is a chaser pile which hammers the third set to the skirt leg. Thereafter, the chaser pile is removed by ILT once the set piles are inserted, the pile grippers on the set piles are activated. When piling is completed, the space between the skirt leg and pile is crowded using concrete board by the crouch lines. The boat landing and barge bumpers are installed at the end. This completes the installation of the MNP jacket. So that was how we construct a platform, whether it's a big jacket or a small jacket, that's how it is. Can you see my screen now? Hello? Um, is no. it possible to see? No? No, sir. The screen, uh, the presented okay. screen is not visible, sir. Okay, one second, one second. Yeah. So I basically, yeah. So the next video is uh, basically we did the simulation of that particular jacket uh, while launch in Moses. So I'll just show uh, quickly at uh, that one. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So that's what's done in uh, Moses. And you can see basically the actual versus how the Moses simulated it.
So basically, we had the privilege of doing that simulation for Sapura and LNT, and uh, it was almost accurate what Moses did compared. You can see that video was real, uh, and it in real time we could uh, simulate it uh, a thirteen thousand ton jacket in uh, Moses. I'll go back to uh, the uh, the the PowerPoint now. I hope you might have already seen now the the platform construction, the loadout, the transport, the install, the launch, which will give a approximate idea how we are installing offshore structures in sea. Can you all see my screen now? Yes, sir. So this, all this was shown in the video. You can see the, the fabrication, transportation, the towing, and then we showed the, the, the Moses simulation of the launch. This side, so, okay. So the next uh, topic is uh, pipelines and rises. So as you know, now after the structure is installed, drilled and ready, and now we need to basically transfer the, the crude or oil and gas both. Uh, wire risers and uh, pipelines either to an onshore refinery or to an FPSO or an FSO. So in all offshore fields, we will basically have a lot of subsea pipelines, which is a quite a challenging uh, topic, uh, which you guys doesn't study much, but a good opportunity for you to guys in to get into it. Uh, in every offshore field, uh, we come with the uh, pipelines and risers. Uh, so how we install it, uh, normally we in shallow water, it's called S-lay and in deep water, it's called J-lay. And there are other techniques which are not normally used, but uh, where we could not do S-lays, we do a lot of towing method or uh, depends on floating methodology. And uh, the new technology coming is a reel. A uh, lot of pipelines uh, can be reeled and then we don't need this heavy lift vessels. We can do with a, a diving support vessel on reels. Uh, people are coming with a, a different uh, uh, type of thing to reduce the cost again for the, the pipelines. Uh, but the normal technique is a pipeline barge, uh, basically doing in an X-lay using a stringer and a tensioner, basically. So it's welding, laying, continue, and pipelines on seabed. So this is the sequence normally followed. And after that, you will basically end this pipeline in a pipeline and manifold where the oil is again passed through two floating hoses, as you can see, uh, to a buoy and then to a shuttle tanker. This is one methodology of export storage and offloading, which is SBM, uh, single buoy mooring. Uh, or you could lay this pipeline all the way to the onshore refineries uh, and uh, take it from there. Some of the offshore construction vessels we using, heavy lift pipeline barges, heavy lift crane barges, uh, DSVs, uh, DP2, DP3, anchor handlers for basically putting the anchors on the moorings, support vessels and crew boats. So these are the types of offshore construction vessels we are using in offshore industry. Mooring is a very important uh, topic uh, and from the naval attack point, it's also very important. A uh, lot of uh, analysis is required to moor any vessel. Spread moor turret can be a uh, uh, convoy, can be DP, so all this comes also as a part of uh, naval architecture scope uh, when it comes to the offshore industry. The mooring is also very critical. Same export facility. So this is a typical calm boy with a tanker. So the tanker weather winds 360 degree on the boy. So either otherwise we have to go with a spread moor on the tanker. That's another option. Or there are turret moored uh, FPS on deep water, basically. And deployment deployment basically used us to convert the, the rigid pipeline to a flexible line where basically we are transporting the crude to the tanker via the, the floating hose and the, the subsea hoses. This slide again, I will just go fast. A lot of vessels are being used in different uh, types of vessels. I'll go to another video showing the pipeline. Uh, give me one second. Um, is proven.
So, the video is not clear. Can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So that basically is a laying of a pipeline to the seabed. And now we are going to install the, the export facility, which is basically a plum hoses and a boy. Uh, it's another project, so don't uh, mix the two.
Thank you. So that is basically an export uh, facility, plum, spools and hoses. So go back to the presentation. trying to use the page. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are seeing. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Hello? Who is there? Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Connection gone. No, it's still there. Disconnected or yeah, right, we can, but nobody is talking. I cannot hear you. Is anyone talking? Hello. Yes, it's yes, sir. We can hear you. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's from India. Okay, I'll continue. I think you can hear, right? Because I didn't hear anybody from your side. Yeah, we can hear your side. Maybe something you're going to hear. Yes, sir. 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 Hello? So we, are, we, are, we can yes, hear sir. you, yes, sir. Okay. Hello? You can hear us, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I can't hear you. Huh? You're mute. You're on mute. No, no. One second. Okay. Let me just check. Okay. Uh, you are in the department now? It's on. Why am I not able to hear?
Sir, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'll again start again the screen. Yeah. Okay. Now my battery is also low. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you just give me the power? Yeah. Okay. I'll just... You can see my screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So basically, now we go into the services, which play also a key part in the success of any offshore project. So it could be well services, completion of wells, surveys, welding, NDT, pigging and hydro testing, piling, trenching and burial, and also I, I missed out diving. So we do a lot of diving, as you can see from the the video. Going to deep water uh, developments, uh, main difference, as you can see, is all subsea. There will not be much surface except the, the FPSO or a TLP type of rig, uh, which you can see. So basically, subsea is all about on the seabed on deep water. Uh, more, more than 3,000 feet, uh, we are going the, uh, on the subsea developments. Uh, uh, everything is small, modular, and uh, very high, high level people like Cameroon, G. They are playing this uh, uh, all the segments. So there'll be a lot of uh, uh, subsea wells, and then again, uh, booster stations, production manifolds, risers connecting to the, the FPSO. That will be the final level of connection to the, to the surface. And we normally have a turret mode FPSO for the export uh, facility and with a shuttle tanker, which basically takes the crude away. And due to the water depth, uh, we cannot go with a, a calm boy or a spread mode. So we need to go with a, a turret mode uh, FPSO for uh, deep water development. So these are the type of structures we are using, semi-submersible and uh, SPAR, uh, predominantly for the deep water application. And lastly, as I mentioned, the decommissioning and abandonment also is a uh, part of the, the offshore construction activity, although it is done at the last stage. Uh, so this is also becoming a lot of fields are old. And so this has become another opportunity for people to get involved into the decommissioning and abandonment. Basically, it's removing, closing the well and removal of the structures from the sea. And to be and, uh, fair now, uh, the whole world is moving in the renewable energy sector because of the, the emission. Everybody wants to stop the CO2. So there'll be a lot of uh, opting coming on the renewable energy sector also, which is not really oil and gas. It's a different structure, but the type of structures, the type of operations, what I showed is applicable again in this uh, renewable energy part also. So uh, this is another segment where you know, a lot of uh, things can be looked at uh, for future. Because of the time, I'm going to go a little faster on the on this uh, slides. So that's how the today's oil production versus consumption. So basically, as you know, uh, US, Saudi, these are the biggest uh, producing people. And when you take it, India, we consume a lot, but we don't produce more. So we are importer of oil. And you guys always have a higher oil price in India. Uh, we trying to develop a lot of fields in India, but um, it's slow. Uh, so this will give a worldwide uh, uh, a comparison uh, where you can see Asia is not doing very well. Uh, and America is doing very well because uh, they, they found a lot of oil. So they, they are consuming more, but uh, they also have oil. And Middle East is one of the successful uh, area where a lot of oil is there and uh, less consumptions. Africa is similar. Uh, and uh, so that's just a comparison for you guys to understand where is the today where we are on the consumption versus production. Same thing on the gas. So gas is getting a lot of interest. Uh, we can basically gas is going to be used by a lot of uh, countries. So that's current uh, world res resource. It's actually an old slide on 2018. So I'm not going too much on this OPEC versus non-OPEC countries. This is India for uh, two areas. One is Western, which is Mumbai high, which is uh, shallow water. Uh, the video which showed on the jacket was for Mumbai high. And the new, uh, the KG basin is deep water where more of the gas is coming. It's a very uh, deep water uh, development. Already Reliance, ONGC are all, all, all there. So this is uh, also getting developed faster. Middle East, 
Yes, every every country in Middle East is basically producing, so it's a it's a good uh, opportunity for people to come to Middle East, especially in the oil and gas sector. Biggest oil and gas companies, so PetroChina, Sinopec, Aramco, BP, Exxon. So these these are still the bigger players uh, compared in the IOCs. Of course, there are small NOCs also there at NOC and Aramco also is in the list. Oil majors, basically same. I'm just going fast. Yeah, this country is. I'll I'll anyway give this uh, slides later so that you can read it. So national oil companies are government law organizations, and these are service companies which are involved. A lot of service companies where you can get involved, uh, which are into offshore oil and gas industry, fabrication shipyards. So that is where a lot of fabrication happens. FPSO is a big market. So Singapore, Korea, China, all, all are making FPSOs, which is taking a lot of people uh, where naval artists can get a good opportunity. This is most important to understand where to get the knowledge base. Most of these informations are on the internet, technical publications, memberships to international organization. IID has got a lot of knowledge base shared, industrial expert talking, which you guys are already doing, industrial visits to yards, companies, fabrication, refinery, service companies, so if you get involved, then you get a network and you get a good knowledge base to come into oil and gas industry. So how to get involved also is very important to know the right attitude. It's in tough ter terrains we are working. A lot of times we have to tell yes and keep it simple is the normal principle we follow. Uh, higher studies will help offshore engineering, hydrodynamics structural engineering, pipeline, petroleum engineering, geotech. All this will cater a significant improvement in your um, education when you apply for jobs into the oil and gas sector. Strong networking so that you can connect people like us. We will help you uh, develop communication skills, which is very important. Uh, shift to countries of interest, I showed which are the countries which are producing. And of course, industrial and software training to fill those gaps. So you guys are studying, so there's a lot of gaps to be filled. Uh, if you can do some courses, it will be always great. Softwares, I don't mention a lot of softwares uh, involved. Uh, typically, you should know at least this as minimum. One of this, AutoCAD, Rhino, any of the ship geometries, so any of the structural softwares, any of the hydrodynamic Moses or Kerflex or pipe. And if you have Excel and MathCAD capabilities, it will help actually. So that's from the analysis point of view. Uh, if you want to look at project engineering, project management, and all those things, then communication attitude will come into play. Knowledge base is important. Doesn't mean to be analytical alone. That is actually the completion of my presentation. Uh, if I have a time, I have one more video, but again, that is a deep water. Uh, uh, if you, otherwise we can go into the questions. It depends on, on the forum. Uh, you can proceed, sir. I can put, okay. So I'll just show last, I think there's one more video, which I'll then can just. Wells and producing from there is no Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just trying to find that video also. Oh, video, one more video. Yeah, one more video and then we can close. Actually, there was. Uh, okay. I think uh, I'll I'll not go with that. Uh, it's not required actually. So we can uh, we can do something different. I think I'll go on something on the mooring. Uh, let me see. You can see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay.
it's one on the wind farm as well as gives a in depth into the mooring of offshore structures Okay, I think uh, I will end my videos with that. Uh, uh, um, if you can go, we can go into the question and answer sessions. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, okay. Uh, this comes to end of this wonderful session and it was very informative and the videos made it more interesting also. Now I request everyone to look at the chat box and please fill up the feedbacks provided there. For the time being, I would like to start the Q&A session now, interested people can turn on their mic and ask. If anyone couldn't ask directly, can also ask a Q&A section in the box and also in the YouTube comment section. I will read out, okay? Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, this, good. Uh, yeah. This is uh, Rajesh. I'm a faculty from Ship Technology. Yeah. Uh, yes. um, yeah uh, the, the question, um, it's not a question, it's just a comment that, you know, it's very interesting that you have shown a lot of offshore uh, platform installation, uh, the mooring and pipeline installment, etc. Um, so, uh, you know, it's uh, very good uh, for the students, but I think uh, for our beta naval architecture uh, students, what they have an option is that in uh, semester seven or semester eight, there can be one elective uh, for design of offshore uh, structures so that they can actually learn these uh, things and uh, they can use it. Uh, what's your opinion, uh, Dev Prasad? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, definitely offshore. Uh, Structures, as you know, I think a lot of our alumni are already working in most of these companies. What I showed, uh -huh. actually, a lot of people. I think if you take yeah. today naval architects, I think a lot of people are already in oil and gas structure. Whether it's yeah, you know, one of one of the uh, one of the thing that you have uh, shown is that for higher depths, uh, around uh, three thousand feet, it's actually floating shipping is being used 
for drilling oil and all so definitely naval architects can contribute in that aspect all basically anything what i shown today a naval architect can go because of two reasons one is we are studying a lot of applied mechanics uh, we are studying a lot of structures uh, multidisciplinary uh, subjects are there plus uh, we come with the unique knowledge of uh, what is in the sea and how how wind wave currents act on it moorings motions so uh -huh. we have already done 80% of that it's only i think the tools and the codes yeah. and uh, yeah. basically understanding of this and opportunity maybe not uh, we will not get because there's a lot of other naval architects from internationally also coming in the market so uh, as you know it's in uk us uh, and europe sector mm -hmm. which are doing the deep water designs and everything like technip a uh, companies mm -hmm. we can connect easily but i think yes you are right unless we have a something which is very clearly yeah, on our yeah ship technology department our department is having orca flux license is there so we can um, make uh, students to learn that uh, software so that's very important i i think i mentioned the software uh, i yeah. can again flash i i saw that i think uh, moses uh, is available sax is available uh, and orca flux this three uh, definitely will help us and also any of the fa like ansys uh, or or, uh, or uh, any of the uh, finite element ansys is predominantly the best or sysam uh, dnv supports a lot of educational uh, dnv has got a lot of software tools for pipeline uh, pipeline is a very important subject also uh, just to uh, contemplate just not only the design of the vessel i think we should look at pipelines uh, risers uh, and uh, cables flexibles all, all this can be in the elective actually so basically you know as we do a lot of projects uh, in the last year uh, some of these projects uh, with the help of outside people a lot of uh, alumni are in this industry i'm i'm just one of them i'm sure there are a lot of people who are very much in that topic yeah and you could able to actually simulate uh, the uh, the floating of that uh, short platform jacket platform into the sea uh, correctly so you know that's a uh, you know that's a new uh, new thing that we cannot do it using experiment so only option is numeric method so you could able to do it using the so that's a good oh, so moses is used very much in worldwide now uh, it's it's a product which uh, i we we developed uh, a lot of this market for moses and we are very strong in moses actually uh, we can do a lot of simulation that was just a simple simulation on the launch but uh, there's a multiple body mooring analysis semi sub mooring you can do anything in moses anything can be simulated actually so yes it is not easy to uh, understand the software but uh, if you train people uh, i think they can get involved into a lot of uh, a lot of uh, simulations yeah in the future we will purchase that software or moses also will purchase in our chief technology department and uh, now orca flux is there uh, then abacus is there in abacus is good like ansys abacus is very good and i'm sure dnv also supports educational institutions so dnv sysam is very good tool uh, sysam is almost similar to sax and uh, of course sax is uh, ruling the world i will tell but uh, sysam is also good which i think they will give a support to the educational institution and i'm sure uh, dnv supports uh, uh, definitely uh, if you request Okay, so, uh, students so please have... ask questions here yeah. okay uh, so we are having questions in the chat box uh, what are the sources of power uh, in oil rigs and feasibility of solar power in oil rigs yeah, today the power is uh, diesel uh, diesel engines okay we are not really moved into solar today uh, it's uh, we are still old uh, version of uh, i think the guys but i'm sure the new new uh, vessels are all lng Uh, so uh, gas is going to be the key uh, source uh, lng will be looked at i don't think solar is really looked at today i have not seen anything on solar till now uh, on on any of this uh, offshore uh, uh, vessel so basically uh, it is uh, diesel today the diesel engines are main source of course uh, the gas is coming and uh, mo you will see when you come out i think it will be more uh, gas turbines Uh, I think the doubt is cleared. Uh, we are moving to the next. Uh, what are the safety measures while doing oil and gas upstream operations? Not 
as you know you are seen accidents uh, every year there will be a lot of accidents crane operations mooring failures uh, punch through on rakes uh, a fire so i think uh, abs dnv class uh, if you design something uh, the fire and safety the hazardous area the paint which we are using to protect uh, the structures when there is a fire that paint should withstand uh the layout is very much important so when you design any offshore structures the layout becomes the most important part and the layout has to be approved by uh, somebody like third party like dnv lloyd so abs uh, they they have a lot of uh, 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 there are a lot of codal requirements it's not easy although just to tell you that offshore structure doesn't needs a class like a ship yeah offshore structure really don't need a class but any of the module which is coming as mobile offshore drilling units like semi sub uh, fpso or uh, all are on class uh, an offshore platform typically we go through a third party process rather than a classification because it is a fixed structure so we don't need a class there but to stress that the safety is very very uh, important and everything is looked at from that perspective so safety comes first we don't want to lose any life uh, but as you know there is a lot of shortcuts uh market is down a lot of people are not doing the maintenance uh, everybody wants to spend less capex money so accidents are becoming quite common uh, expert people are gone from the market so we see a lot of accidents uh, so definitely um, this is a concern uh, so uh, i have to just tell that safety is definitely an important factor in designing offshore platforms <laughs> Yes. So then, the next question. Uh, so, since the future of offshore is being said as gas, uh, what is your opinion on FLNG? Yes. Uh, see, uh, as you know, whatever I seen shown today, whether it's oil or whether it's gas or whether it's solar or whether it's floating uh, wind, the application is same. The software remains same. Uh, the design applications remain same the codes are not going to change so whether it's lng whether it's uh, floating lng whether it's uh, fsr whether it's fpso whether it's uh, wind uh, you guys are don't have to worry as long as you know the principles behind the design the codes behind the design the software is behind the design so that is going to be the predominantly important factor actually so you don't have to really worry uh, what is coming in the future as long as you are into this um into the scheme of understanding the whole uh, oil and gas you can apply it to gas or to uh, renewables okay next question uh, sir how to estimate the amount of oil and gas reserves before drilling uh, it's a very uh, good question um, <laughs> there's a lot of software slumberger and halliburton has designed uh, so basically we use uh, softwares uh, from the seismic survey data and uh, that software is basically has got the tools to basically do the reservoir calculation but end of the day you still need to do the drilling uh, to test the well the pressure the flow still the drilling is mandatory for confirming the fid which is the the financial investment decision which is called fid needs a drilling and that is where problems normally for private investors are facing because drilling is an expensive uh, game where uh, seismic plus uh, uh, doing a estimate is very easy but that will not suffice an fid so an fid requires at least drill one well to confirm the the flow is there as per the studies i think the doubt is clear uh so i'm moving to the next question uh so the what are the key knowledge is required for a naval architect to excel in this field i think i already put that slide i can again flash it so that uh, you can just uh, see i think i put it very clearly what is uh, required uh you can see my screen right yes yes sir yes sir go yes, on okay. so i think i put it very clearly here uh this is what is required <laughs> there's no other requirement so develop the right attitude very important i am mentioning of ir studies because of our technical nature and uh, if you can understand this by courses you don't need to go i'm basically a naval architect i don't have any other qualification today so i am succeeded in the business so as long as you can apply and you can work hard you really don't need to go for ir studies but that will help 
uh, two things one it will gives to a network of outside world and second it gives a lot of skill set a qualification when it comes to the interview uh, strong networking to connect to the people do a lot of industrial uh, talkings linkedin is a good tool use it uh, develop communication skills you need to talk you need to work as a team you cannot do it alone because it's a huge project normally uh, shift to countries of interest if you stay at kerala i am sorry i don't think you will succeed uh, and the, the thing is industrial and software training so this is what is required hope the doubt is cleared uh, next question sir what are the job opportunities for freshers like us in oil and gas offshore fields so that's again a good question so i think you should try in service companies you should try in fabrication shipyards you should try consultancies uh, also like us uh, you can try always we take a lot of uh, newcomers uh, train them and then of course they are grown and they go to people you cannot go directly into drilling companies you cannot directly go into oil companies it's very difficult but i think if you look at service companies if you look at uh, shipyards and fabrication yards and you look at basically consultancy firms and uh, and installation contractors like mcdermott sipom subsea 7 i think they give a opportunity for freshers to work as a field engineer uh, if you really can prove that you are good at uh, what i just uh, uh, informed what you need okay so uh, a lot of service providers are there lot of service providers is there okay don't look at the big picture look at segment it to bottom so a lot of uh, diving companies a uh, lot of uh, survey companies a uh, lot of vendors which are supplying things uh, so you start somewhere bottom of that line and then you start building your uh, knowledge base and then you will get an opportunity for sure at certain amount of time to get into the projects yes so um, then um, if all your doubts are cleared Uh, we can end this Q&A session. If anyone uh, still having any doubts, uh, feel free to ask now. Okay, anyone? Okay. Um, I think uh, this. makes the end of the session uh, q and a session okay uh, from our side we are presenting a token of gratitude to mr devi prasad sir the token of gratitude will be presented in the screen right now yeah thank you thank you thank you thanks for the thanks for the audience and thanks for your time thank you um this marks the end of the fifth episode of snas webinar i hope you all enjoyed the webinar on behalf of snas i would like to express my sincere gratitude to mr devi prasad sir for taking time from his valuable schedule and making this a very informative webinar i am deeply thankful to mas and all the office bears for helping us to conduct this informative webinar my sincere gratitude to all the members of dostas from all over the world for the exceptional commitment to the department and on this occasion i would like to thank professor dr a madhyarajan sir hod of department of ship technology for being a constant inspiration for us thank you sir uh, i would like to thank anup sir snas faculty advisor for being with us in all activities conducted by snas last but not least I would like to thank every faculties and the students who put their sincere effort to attend this webinar and making it a grand success. Finally, your feedbacks are very important to us and always feel free to contact us for the feedbacks. Now, this marks the end of this episode and more webinar episodes are on the way. By this I declare that the meeting is concluded. I request everyone to leave the meeting. Thank you so Thank you.